Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're up to about 75 percent. We'll just have to go with that. This morning we're going to talk a little bit about fear as it relates to grace. How many of you have ever been afraid before? All right. As much as we like to think that we might be tough or strong, if we're really honest, all of us can admit this morning that there's been times in our lives where we have dealt with fear and we've been afraid. In fact, there are over 520 documented phobias. How many of you have a phobia? All right. Several of you. All right, there's all kinds of phobias. It's really interesting to look them up and, and uh, see all these sort of weird things that some people are afraid of. But the word phobia, uh, it is a form of fear, but this is what the definition of phobia is. A phobia is a form of fear which storms your mind and shakes your confidence. You lack the courage to face specific situations in life. Now just think about that. It says you lack the courage to face specific situations in life. Here's the thing, whether or not you have any phobias or not, whether or not I have any phobias or not, there will be times in this life where you will feel like I cannot face what's in front of me. You'll have times in life where you come across circumstances. Some of you might be there right now. Some of you have been there before. And all of us, every single one of us will be there at some point in our life. Where you will run across circumstances. You will run across a situation that you feel like it saps your confidence and your courage. And you will not know what to do. And it's in these moments that we have to ask this question, what does God have to offer for me in this moment? What does God have to say about how I am to handle this situation? What does God have to offer me when I'm weak and when I'm afraid? I mean, yes, He saves me and I'm, I'm going to heaven one day, but what about those moments in life where I'm terrified? What about those moments in life where the circumstances of life seem so big that they feel like they're going to crush me? What does God have to say about that? What happens when we feel weak and overwhelmed? Well, to answer that question, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. Because the Apostle Paul, who knew God in such a great way, he had this amazing conversion. Remember on the way to Damascus, God intersects his life. Jesus appears to him. He commissions him to take the gospel to the world. But even Paul dealt with things in his life that overwhelmed him to the point where he did not know how to handle it. And so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll begin by looking at verses 7, just 7 and 8 to begin with. And just a quick background here, Paul is appealing to, to them uh, about his credentials. He's writing to the church to, to correct some things, some false teaching that was infiltrating the church. And just to remind them about why he had the authority to do this, he not only talked about his position as an apostle, but he says, God gave me this vision, this experience, about 14 years ago where I was caught up into heaven or else it was a dream. He says, either way I don't know, but God gave me this experience where I saw him in his glory and I saw heaven and I saw this amazing, amazing thing. But in order to keep me humble, he's going to talk about that God allowed something into his life, something that Paul wanted nothing to do with, but it was through which Paul learned something so incredibly valuable about life, and he uses it then to teach us. And so that's the, the context of where we're looking at, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And so as we look at these verses, we sort of get a picture of what Paul was going through, right? He says, I had this amazing revelation which could have puffed me up, it could have made me proud, and so God allowed me to experience something to keep me humble. And he describes it as a thorn in my flesh. How many of you have ever had a thorn in your flesh. Alright, was it painful? Alright, and so we know that, that whatever Paul is going through, and Paul was used to pain, right? Paul was used to trials. Paul went through all kinds of trials and pain and difficulties. But whatever this thing was, 
Paul says, it was like a thorn in my flesh. It was physical. It was real. And, and so we know this, this thing was physical. And it was painful. And you know, a lot of times, you've, you've probably heard this passage preached, and we like to speculate, don't we? About what it was. Because Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he never tells us what it is. And there are a lot of different theories and possibilities, but I believe that Paul was very intentional about not telling us what it was. Because, you see, it can be anything. See, it could be anything. You see, Paul, it was a certain thing, but it could be anything. It could be an overwhelming situation at school. It could be a challenge that you're facing at home. It could be a challenge or a struggle with disease or sickness. It could be the loss of someone that you love. It could be a relationship problem. It could be an issue with your parents. It could be anything. But Paul's it was physical. It was real. But he says not only was it physical, but it was spiritual. He says it was a messenger of Satan. So he says, I, I was under a physical attack. It was a thorn in my flesh. It was real. It was physical. But he says it was also spiritual. It was a messenger of Satan that God allowed into his life. And then he said, it was there to torment me. Literally that word means to strike with the fist. How many of you have ever been struck with a fist? <laughs> All right, wow. I'm not the only one. I remember there was a time in uh, elementary school where I got struck by a fist. I had said something to someone that I thought was quite smart and clever, and they thought that it deserved a strike with a fist. And it really did deserve a strike with a fist. <laughs> it was painful. Paul's it. We don't know what it was, but it was physical, it was spiritual, and it was exceedingly painful. You see, in life, you and I are going to find situations where we come across situations that are physical, they hurt us, spiritual, there's a spiritual attack, there's things going on in our life, and it will be painful. And Paul said, three times, I begged God to take it away. Three times, Paul says, I begged God, I pleaded with God, God, take it away. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Where there was something going on in your life, a trial, a problem, a hurt, and you just wanted God to take it away. And here's the thing, you know he could. Right, we just sang about it, right? He, he, he caused the lame to walk and the blind to see. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. There's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that his power cannot accomplish. And so Paul knew that God could take his it away. He knew that God could remove this it from his life. Whatever it was, God could do it. And so Paul begged and he pleaded with God to take it away, but God didn't. Take it away. You see, sometimes God doesn't take it away. And we don't always understand why God doesn't take it away. But it was in God not taking Paul's it away that Paul learned something about God and learned something about his walk with God that he would have never known otherwise. And not only did Paul learn this, but he shared it with us. And it's something that all of us need to realize. And that's this. Paul learned that God's grace was sufficient. God's grace. Look in verse 9. We'll get there in just a moment. But he says, my grace. He says, God's answer. God's answer to my asking him to take it away was this. My grace is sufficient for you. Six words that you will absolutely have to cling to in life. And you might need them today. My grace. My grace is sufficient for you. To be sufficient means to be unfilled with unfailing strength. You see, you're going to have situations in life where you say, my strength is gone. My strength is failing. But God's strength is unfailing and His grace provides us with unfailing strength to handle anything that comes our way. 
We sang Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus last night. It was written by a, a woman named Louisa Steed. She was from England, but she had moved to the United States to study and to prepare for missions. She wanted to be a missionary, but she had some health problems that seemed to prevent her from doing that. But she got married and she was living here in New York, uh, closer to the coast. And she had a daughter. And one day they went to the beach, her husband and her daughter. And while they were there, a young man began to struggle in the water. And Louisa's husband went out to try to save this young man. But in the process of trying to rescue him, they both drowned as Louisa and her daughter watched helplessly. In, this was in the late 1800s. It was very hard for a woman to find work or a job, and so she struggled to provide food for herself and her daughter. But God always met their need, even to the point where sometimes they had nothing left, and they would come home and find groceries on their step. And Louisa came to a place where she realized that God's grace was enough, that he allowed her to walk through some painful circumstances, but his grace was enough to take care of them. And that's why she wrote, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word." That's why she was able to write those words, because she experienced it. And eventually, she was able to move to the mission field, and she served God in South Africa. She met a man there and married, and they served God together, and she experienced God's grace. Her daughter married D.A. Carson and served God greatly with her life. But it was in this absolute moment of weakness that she realized that God's grace was sufficient for her. And then she said, oh, for grace, what? To trust him more. God's grace sustains us because God's grace is sufficient. Look at verse 9. He says, Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you. Or, 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 he's writing this, but this is God speaking. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. You see, it's in our weaknesses that God's put on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. See, it changed Paul's perspective when he got God's answer. He says, now I look at my weaknesses differently. I look at my situations differently because I see that these are opportunities for the matchless grace of God to give me power and strength. I delight in weakness, in insults. Boy, that takes a lot to say, doesn't it? I delight in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak then I'm strong. What does God have to offer you when you're weak and when you're afraid? He offers His grace. His matchless, unlimited, sustaining grace. And His grace strengthens us. And here's the thing. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know the depth of your struggle or your hurt or how overwhelmed you might feel. But I know something. God's grace is bigger than your it. God's grace is bigger than your it. Whatever it is, God's grace is bigger. And His grace is sufficient. David Jeremiah said it like this. He says, The weakness of humanity is the proper container to glorify God. Isn't that a great thought? The weakness of humanity is the proper container to glorify God. That it's in our weaknesses. It's in those moments where we feel overwhelmed and we feel like we just can't go on and we can't face it. It's then that God says, my grace will strengthen you and sustain you and I will be glorified in your life. His grace is sufficient. And His grace works best in our weakness. Therefore, when it comes to all those things that we're afraid of, all those things that we struggle with, all those things that we don't know how to handle, God's grace gives us unfailing strength. Its grace is bigger than your it. Let's just go back and uh, look at these verses again. As you're thinking about this, he says, I came to a place where I will boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He says, for Christ's sake, so that he can be glorified in me, I delight in my weaknesses, in my insults, in my hardships, in my persecutions, in my difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, we so many times, we want to be strong in our own strength, don't we? We want to be strong and we want to think that we can handle it and that we've got it all together. Did you ever feel like you had to make it look like you had it all together? Alright, listen. 
we don't have it all together, do we? No matter how much we can put on the facade that we have it all together, I know you don't have it all together. And guess what? I don't either. But God's grace is sufficient. And His grace strengthens us. And His grace works best in our weakness. He says, I delight in or I take pleasure now in my weaknesses. The, the message, and, and I know we talked about the message last week. I know it's just one guy putting the Bible in his own words. It's not a translation. You with me? All right. Don't stone me. But the message says this and puts Paul's words like this. He says, I quit focusing on the handicap and I began appreciating the gift. You see, this experience changed Paul's perspective because so many times when we go through those hard moments, we get so consumed on the it. We get so consumed on the problem. We get our eyes so focused on our circumstances that we lose sight of God, that we lose sight of how big He is and great He is and how He can help us. And I want you to know that that's a natural thing that happens, but God wants us not to focus on the it, but on Him. It's kind of like when Peter was walking on the water, right? When his eyes were on Jesus, he was walking on the water. He was doing the impossible. But when his eyes were on the wind and the waves, he began to sink. And so Paul says, I changed my whole perspective. I quit focusing on my handicap. And I began to take pleasure, appreciating the gift. It was a choice. You see, when we face these circumstances in life that overwhelm us, we have to make a choice. Am I going to run to God and rest in this grace or am I going to try to go through it without His grace and without His strength? And I want you to know that you'll fail because without His grace we'll never ever be able to handle life. Our weaknesses cause us to be afraid. Our weaknesses can cause us to despair. But Jesus wants us to remember that His grace is what? His grace is sufficient. It works best in our weakness. It's bigger than your it. And it's sufficient for you. I, I read a story this past year about how God's grace worked in a very sufficient way. And there was, uh, it was a father and a daughter. They're both doctors from Texas. Uh, very committed to Christ. And they have had the privilege of doing medical mission trips to go into places in the world where medical care is severely lacking and offer medical care to show the love and compassion of Christ. One of the places that they travel to is Zimbabwe. And as many of you know, in Africa, AIDS is a very huge problem. And there's millions and millions of people that are infected with HIV. And a lot of people don't want anything to do with them and they won't touch them because they're scared to get it. And so Kyle and his daughter went to Zimbabwe to treat AIDS patients. They knew the risks, they knew the dangers. Well, one day in the midst of everything going on, Kyle and his daughter Heather sat down for a meal. And his, his daughter Heather looked over at her dad, she saw in his hand a cut. And she asked her dad about the cut. And sure enough, he had nicked his hand during surgery on an AIDS patient. And her daughter, the daughter being a doctor as well as her dad, knew what that meant or could mean. And there was really sort of one option that they had. They had an antiviral medication that he could take that would help prevent his body from acquiring this virus. But the downside to that was this, mess, this medicine can make you deathly ill. And so they, he, did not want to take, he did not want to take that risk. He just wanted to trust God and, and not take the medicine. But his daughter insisted, and, and I could put myself in that position, and as his daughter insisted, she wanted his dad, her dad to take the medicine. So he took it. He became very, very ill, nearly to the point of death. And so they knew they had to get him back to the United States. And so they, um, they got on a flight from Zimbabwe and went to another country to try to get back to where they could get back to the States. Eventually they get to South Africa. His health was deteriorating. And she at this point had been traveling for hours and hours with her dad. She was absolutely at the point of exhaustion. She was overwhelmed and overcome. She was able to talk to the airline and to the pilots. She was able to explain to them the situation. And from South Africa back to Atlanta, Georgia, they had a 17 hour flight facing them. And so as they prepared for this flight, she says, I need you to get my dad back to the States. And so they let him on the plane, because sometimes they don't let sick people on airlines. But they let him on. But she was so overwhelmed at how she was going to care for her dad on this flight. She was already exhausted. They'd already been traveling for over a day. 
and she did not know how she was going to make it. Her dad was slumped over in the seat. She was becoming physically ill to the point where she was nauseous and she went to the bathroom and she was just absolutely broken. And she began to cry out to God for help. And she had no idea. She just felt like there was nothing. She was so empty. And eventually uh, someone began to knock on the bathroom door. They became concerned about her. And she, she came out and she said, I, I'm okay, I'm a doctor and, and I, I know what's going on with me. And, and he said, well, ma'am, I'm a doctor too. And he said, not only am I a doctor, but I'm traveling with 99 of my colleagues. <laughs> you see, she thought that there's no way that there could be anyone there to help her and God had prepared a hundred people to help her. You see, God's grace is bigger than your it. And they were able to say, you know what, you can just go and rest. And she was able to go and sleep. So they said, we will take care of your dad. She woke up hours later. Her dad was awake and alert and talking, still very ill. But God's grace was available to her. And God's grace healed her dad. He doesn't have HIV and they continue to this day to serve God and go on medical mission trips. And the point isn't whether or not God healed him or not, but the point was that God's grace was sufficient. And in a moment where she felt like her need couldn't possibly be met, God's grace was able to meet her need 100 times. And I want you to know this morning that God's grace is available for you, and His grace is sufficient. And whatever it is that you're going through and you're facing, and I know some of you have some big it's in your life right now. And I want you to know that God's grace is sufficient. And you need to hold on to that. Paul, as he wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, not his physical son, but Timothy was a man that he had led to Christ, that he had mentored and trained. And as he wrote to him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, here's the situation. Paul is in a Roman cell awaiting his execution. He knows that this time he's not getting released. His execution has been set and he's awaiting death. And as he awaits death, he writes one last letter to his son Timothy in the faith. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul came to experience that his grace was sufficient for himself. And he says, I'm here awaiting my execution. But you know what? I am strong. So he said, Timothy, be strong. Be confident in who God is. And be strong in his grace. Because His grace is sufficient. Listen, I know that your it is physical. It's real. It hurts. I know that your, your it is spiritual because you have an enemy. You have an adversary called Satan who loves to bring pain into your life. But God uses it for His purpose. It's spiritual. It's painful. But His grace is sufficient. And you can rest in that. And because of that, here's the thing. We can live with confidence. I like to call it god give you a new word for today. Because confidence is really being confident about yourself. And God doesn't want us to be confident about ourselves. But He wants us to be confident about who He is in us, right? And I call that Godfidence. And that means no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter how great the storm, we can live with Godfidence, with a confidence that comes from God. Because His grace will give us strength. His grace is sufficient. It's full of unfailing strength. And God wants you to rest in that today. You're going to need those six words as you go throughout life. Don't forget them. When you're in the midst of that trial, just remember, God's grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient. Listen, trouble, problems, sickness will always populate your world. But they don't control it. Grace does. Would you bow your heads this morning? And just with, with no one looking around and just in taking a moment of reflection, how many of you, and I, I know some of you have already shared some things with me and with your counselors, but how many of you would just be honest and say, I'm facing a pretty big it right now and it's overwhelming me and I've, I really just came in here this morning feeling overwhelmed. Would you raise your hand? All right, thank you so much. I, I ask you to do that because I just want to be able to pray for you. And I want you to know this morning that although I don't fully understand what you're going through, the God of heaven, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. He understands and he knows Jesus was touched with your infirmities. He was touched by your weaknesses. He suffered more greatly than any of us ever have or will. And he knows and he cares about your pain. And in the midst of your pain, he wants to offer you something that you need. And that's his sustaining grace. His sufficient grace. 
And he wants you to rest in that and experience his power in your weakness. It's your weaknesses, not your strengths, that are the place that God will be most glorified in your life. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. Father, I know so many of them raised their hands this morning. And Father, I know that they're facing some huge circumstances. And I know all of us will face its in life. And Father, I pray that we would never, ever forget that your grace is enough. That your grace is filled with unfailing strength for our weakness and our pain and our hurt and our trials. And Father, I pray that we would remember that you're a God who gives grace lavishly above and beyond. And may we learn to run to you in our trials. When we're overwhelmed, when we can't handle it, when our courage is gone, when our fear is overtaking us, and when strength seems to fail us, Father, may we look to your unfailing strength. May we rest in your grace. And may we able, be able, like Paul, to face whatever comes our way with that knowledge that your grace is enough. Father, thank you for giving us this sustaining grace. Father, thank you for allowing our weaknesses to be places where you can be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.